Thank you so much. Hi, I'm Alyssa Yakudi London from the Clinkett Tribe of Alaska. It's an honor to be with both of you today. I'm a guest host for Native America Calling, and we are going to use this segment for part of the radio show. But I also, Sierra, listened to the one you did back in April 2021. So Hopefully we'll build on that interview. Um, awesome, awesome. Good to be yeah, here. Yeah, and uh, Michael, uh, you know, thank you as well for um, contributing and you have an illustrious career. So where I want to start out is I, I want to uh, congratulate both of you for bringing to light so many um, important Native issues uh, across Indian country for the audience that probably doesn't typically see it. Uh, Sierra, I want to direct this initially to you. How do you start with an issue like NAGPRA, uh, or I'm, I'm sure we're going to get into uh, maybe even boarding school conversation at some point, these really tough topics about our history and uh, bridge them into a way that is probably palpable for an audience that would otherwise know nothing. Yeah. I mean, I think growing up concepts like NAGPRA and about land back and about you know repatriation, I grew up with those stories from my aunts and uncles and they were told to me in really dramatic ways. They had, you know, we were kind of natural storytellers in my family and they had twists and turns and they had drama and they had cliffhangers and they had, you know, the beats of a story. And so when it came to working in television comedy for 10 years, you know, you pitch from your life and you pitch stories that are based on, on who you are and the specificity of my life didn't always translate. But when we got into Rutherford Falls and we had a room of native writers, we all started pitching ideas and stories the History Day episode um, stemmed from Bobby Wilson's wife was a judge at a History Day competition and just how that is such a singular experience for a Native person that's very different. And and so inherent in a lot of our, our complexities and, and stories that have a lot of uh, density to them, their built-in is a lot of comedy and absurdity. I often say, you know, my experience as a Native woman comes with a lot of conflict and trauma, but it also is absurd. It's an absurd experience. And I think if you can find a way to to lean into that in a truthful way, in a way that we're in on the joke, I think it actually um, kind of permeates and, and helps people absorb those ideas um, more easily. Thank you. Yeah. And Michael, what was some of the research that you did to inform your character? Did you go to the National Indian Gaming Association conference at all, or give us some <laughs> insight? <laughs> I, I wasn't able to make it. I was I was I was working. I, I was directing another show, and um, I was I was jealously looking at my Twitter feed as as Ed and and, and Ty and Sierra were there. I was like, ah, oh, I wish I could have. Um, you know, spoiler. Uh, I'm not a gambler, um, so whenever I go to casinos, I'm there for the food. <laughs> I, I, I'm just going to be honest about that and the shows. Um, but what's so beautiful about playing Terry is that uh, so much of the storylines, um, you know, really uh, reflect my my life as a as a as a Native man um, in really really great ways. Uh, I think one of the beautiful things about season one is uh, you know that we saw Native families um, not in conflict, um, not uh, in dissolution, um, but actually powerful and joyful and um, ambitious. Uh, you know, there's a great, great scene um, uh, with Terry and his his teenage daughter, Maya. And I just remember thinking like, why don't we see scenes of native men and their, and their, and their daughters having, you know, you know, beautiful, funny conversations. Um, and so I was reminded that, yeah, our lives are absent for the most part from from uh, from our media, and I think it's 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 essential that we tell these stories in order to um, refute you know our our invisibility and and to share our joy. Thank you, Michael. Um, Sierra, something that is really encapsulated in the character of Terry is this otherness that can even happen within the tribe due to status. Uh, where does that inspiration come from and how are you building that and what message are you trying to convey to Indian country or to America about that? I think with the Terry character, it's interesting you say that. I feel like he's the sort of epitome of the Native man that is very aware of how he is perceived. 
and that part of the Native experience is always knowing the expectations non-Native people have, the expectations people in your community have, and how you should be. And I feel like Regan is almost like, like a baby deer just learning a lot of that stuff, whereas Terry is so steeped in, in how he is perceived and how he has to navigate all of these different kind of arenas. And you see him struggle like in fatherhood and in business, but, but he's always aware, I think, of how he, he comes across. I always wanted to do a character like Terry because I, you know, you grow up watching like Sopranos and, and Billions and dramas that have these sort of casino um, CEO characters and they're so flat and they're just straight villains and they're almost sort of twisting their mustache. And I, I know those guys, <laughs> like those guys are also dads. They coach the little league team. They have real motivations for why they're doing them, and a lot of them are culturally specific. And I just always wanted to create a character that had layers because I think that, especially with casino issues, there's a very flattened image of what that life is like and what that business is like, and and it's usually created by non-native people or creating those narratives. Whereas within the communities, I mean, within the writers' room, we had very different views on on casinos and and the purpose within Indian country. And it was like, thank God we have a show where there's multiple native characters who can talk about the benefits who can talk about the criticisms who can give it a really complex um kind of kind of vision of what that is within our our communities and i think terry is a great example of that that on other shows he would just be written off as one note and here i think he is so many different things he is a tribal capitalist he is a father there was an interview that michael did where you said Terry um, says the things out loud that our parents had to whisper. And I think that on some level you can see him as aspirational, but at another way, I grew up with a lot of Terry's. Like I, I have Terry's in my family and, and I also don't want to lose sight of that, that those, those guys exist, those women exist in, in our communities. Thank you. And Michael, the, there's so much complexity as Sierra just noted um, to the character of Terry and with your acting career, you've played in so many different genres. How does that help inform this character? And also, what's it like to not have to play, you know, a stoic Indian? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Um, uh, this show is a gift. Uh, Terry is a gift. And I'm grateful. I'm grateful for the chances um, uh, that this opportunity has afforded me. Uh, I look at you know, it's, it's really interesting, uh, you know, where I sit in my career, like nearly 30 years in, I feel like the roles I've been getting, and especially Terry Thomas, um, is that I needed 28 years to prepare to play him. Um, because uh, the writing is so complex. Uh, for example, in episode two, uh, which is a beautiful episode this season about um, identity appropriation and, and, and pretendians. Or, or, you know, uh, culture, you know, shapeshifters, <laughs> you know, however you want to describe it. Um, it's, it's a funny episode. It's really, it, it's really quite brilliant. But it requires Terry to channel rage, like anger, the anger that we feel in the community um, when we're preyed upon, um, you know, by race shifters. So, uh, you know, the, the writing, even though, it, even though this is a comedy, um, it touches on those things. Like our comedy is never just, you know, just one note. Um, it's layered, it's layered by our history. It's layered by our, our knowledge and, um, there's pain there. Um, so I think, I think I needed all those roles, um, to help balance, uh, who Terry is. Thank you. And Sierra, as a final note, as I got a note that we're wrapping up, what do you want to tell Indian country about what they should mo most look forward to about season two? I mean, there is a romance between um, <laughs> Regan's character and um, a new character named Nelson, played by Dallas Goldtooth. And it is my dream to be the Navajo Nora Ephron. And it was just such a great experience to see them. And they have incredible chemistry together. And I've always wanted to do sort of like a screwball comedy uh, with Native people. And that storyline is one of my favorites. There's also a lot of romance between um, for Nathan this year and, and so many different experiences. And we have incredible guest stars. And I'm just, I'm so excited for everyone to, to see season two. Thank you. And uh, because these haven't told me to stop yet, uh, what about the mayoral, mayoral race? What should we know about that? 
Yeah, um, we created a nemesis this year for Terry's character, played by Gunna Didio Horn, um, Feather Day. And she makes a play to become mayor of Rutherford Falls. And so Terry and, and, and Nathan and Bobby all have to kind of band together to sort of win the town. Um, and she's a formidable opponent for Terry. And it's very fun watching them um, sort of knife it out <laughs> throughout the season. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for contributing to Native America Calling and for all your work on this show. Just an uh, honor to speak with both of you. So, Ganeshish, thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you so Nina's much. Content. Thank you. So, how have you used um, comedy in order to talk about tough topics across Indian country? Um, I think it's, um, we, we, we use it the same way that we use it in community. You know, we use laughter as medicine. We are naturally funny people. You know, <laughs> I think I, I, I heard um, Devery Jacobs uh, give a quote uh, to press at one point. Uh, she said, if we don't laugh, we'll cry. And <laughs> I think that sometimes that is sort of the stance with Native people. You know, we have to make fun of some of these situations that we encounter because it's maddening otherwise. And um, it's been wonderful to explore them in this context, in a comedy context where the wider, um, you know, non-Native audience can experience it alongside us. Thank you. And Ed, what has been some of the biggest learnings you've had about uh, Native American people, Indian country? Um, I don't even know where to start. So much. I mean, it started in the writer's room of, well, it started in, in some of our very first meetings. Uh, Mike Schur and Sierra Teller Ornelas, we, we, the three of us really created this, this world. Uh, and in those first meetings, um, just hearing Sierra's take on certain aspects of our ideas and 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 then building on things. I just started to, I was starting to get a glimpse of more, uh, just a wider spectrum of, of ways to look at this stuff. And then once we all got in the writer's room and we had uh, five or six Native American writers in, in the room, um, I, it, it was just feeling that energy and the the way that the native community makes each other laugh and being welcomed into that. Uh, I think it's those those moments where you're kind of like where you have your guard down, where you learn the most, and you just kind of are appreciating um, the the stories that come up in a writer's room. It's so. It's so you spend a lot of time. What I, I like to think of it as steeping the tea, where where you're not actually working, you're not writing, you're not coming up with ideas, you're just telling stories, and you're everyone's telling just dumb jokes, dumb stories from their lives, and they're like, oh, that made me think of this, and that thing, and it's it's so important to the writing process because you're getting to know each other, and in this case, I was also getting to know the Native American community, or at least this aspect of it that that our writers represented in a way that I didn't, hadn't known before. And so uh, it was, it was seeing a, a kind of, I, I don't want to paint too broad of a brush, but seeing that sort of cultural sense of humor that everyone brought, um, I didn't expect. And, and then all of the specificity that our show has because of who, who this writer's room is, um, I can't say enough. I've just, I've been constantly learning and I'm still learning and it's, it's been You're amazing. You're learn more, right? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Ed. Uh, Jana, I read about your career so far and this has been a long time in the making. The topics that you bring into the show, I mean, as a native person watching it, I'm like, oh, thank goodness. Like someone's talking about it. How much of this has just been brewing in your mind for probably your whole career? Well, yeah, a lot of these stories uh, reflect my experiences in life and also the writer's experiences. You know, we're pulling from um, Tazba Chavez's, you know, experiences and Bobby Wilson's experiences, you know, Sierra's experiences as Native, as Native people. And, um, but yeah, I think um, being, you know, a, 
a native woman sort of centered in a story and getting to play that and and being able to be funny on screen is I never expected to be able to do that. I really didn't have any um, hope that I would even see this role in my lifetime. So to be here and doing it, um, I mean, I'm very grateful that I did, you know, so much comedy, um, you know, in my younger adulthood and um, didn't know that I was practicing for the real thing. Um, but also, uh, yeah, just getting to collaborate with other Native people and to tell stories in this context has just been so rewarding. Um, I feel truly honored to, like, represent, um, you know, Native women and um, funny Native women, which I think, as you know, we all are, every single one of us. Well, Not an unfunny one in the bunch. <laughs> we appreciate the representation even down to the fashion choices. So good job on that. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and Ed, so Nathan, you know, has a heart of gold and but can also come across as really clueless. Um, how do you think that approach to displaying the character also helps to uh, well, navigate these tough topics of like statues and uh, you know heritage pieces, whether they should be you know owned by the tribe or you know you or in someone's garage, you know, in, in that, in the case of that uh, episode. So how does presenting the character in that way allow you to navigate presenting these tough topics to America? Well, I think uh, <clears throat> you kind of uh, nailed it in your description. It, it's our way of having our cake and eating it too. So, so uh, we're having our cake because we're, we're, we have a character who's making really bad mistakes and stumbles and saying dumb, awful things sometimes, but, but we're, common, common mistakes. But, right, right. And, yeah. and that's representative, I think, of a lot of points of view out there that that are fun to challenge and put and are important to challenge. Um, and then we're sort of uh, that's our cake. And then we're eating it, too, because, like you said, we've tried to endow Nathan with a heart of gold that keeps keeps him uh, sympathetic. And if we're doing that successfully, it's a little bit of a magic trick. So um, it allows a, a, hopefully someone in the audience to, to see Nathan's behavior and be like, oh, my gosh, maybe I do I do that, too? Or am I do I think that way sometimes or have I made those stumbles? Um, and then if Nathan is still sympathetic, it allows that person to say, like, well, maybe I can also be a, still be a good person <laughs> and do better. Um, and that. Uh, that's sort of, I think, when it's operating at its like most, uh, when it's really firing on all cylinders. And then as long as it's funny, like as long <laughs> as we're like also just having fun and being incredibly silly and ridiculous with these things, then um, then I don't know, it's, it's hard, but hopefully we're doing it. Hopefully we're pulling it off. Yeah. Even the cringe uh, worthy moments I appreciate because it, it does allow us to actually uh, bring to light some of the issues that otherwise don't get talked about. Uh, Jana, so yeah, my tribe's from Alaska. I read that you grew up in Oregon and that you're Lakota. So you're bringing in a pan-Indian identity into these stories that you're telling. How are you bridging that and being able to represent what the, what the over 500 federally recognized nations in our country? <laughs> it's impossible. Um, I don't think I'm doing that. <laughs> um, but, you know, we try to, all of our writers are from different tribal nations. And so, um, and our cast members as well, you know, we have a lot of people on season two. We do have an Alaska native um, uh, on, you know, in our um uh, housing or uh, land offices <laughs> so we um we celebrate it we celebrate our um nuances and some of the you know wider experiences that we sort of all um ex we, we are all encountering on our daily on a daily basis and that's sort of um the goal of the show is to make sure that we are um covering some of these broader topics that are more pan-indigenous uh you know, experiences, but also um, giving the specificity of character and making sure that each character is rich and has a rich internal life. Um, I think that that's one thing that other, um, you know, in the past uh, television has done to Native people is sort of flattened us and made us 
this one, you know, tiny little guest role be, you know, synonymous of everything in Indian country. And it, it always has to do with casinos. It always has to do with, you know, um, you know, sensitivity, cultural sensitivity or whatever. And they're used as sort of a tool to elevate uh, a white character or, you know, uh, or I don't know. There's just a lot of different ways in which a, a, a native person on screen has been um, sort of diminished to one dimension. So we want to make sure that um, all of our characters, they are native, but they're also, you know, a, a leader or, um, you know, a, a, a stoner or, uh, you know, they're just like, they have many dimensions. There's just a lot of different native people. As you know, we are so diverse. We are not a monolith. And we say that in the first uh, season, that's a big message that we're telling that every native person's experience in identity is different from the next, even within our own families. And um, so we make sure that we write the characters like that. Love that. Obviously, lots more to ask both of you, but thank you so much for contributing to Native America Calling and also creating this important show for Indian country and for America to understand. So thank you, Ed and Jana. See you thank later. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so Bye. much. Thank you. I think what I love about playing Josh on the show, you know, especially in season one, he very much uh, kind of represented a bit of a cliche stereotype, uh, sort of woke, possibly overly educated hipster Brooklynite type of guy uh, who was coming into Rutherford Falls very much with a preconceived notion of uh, what the town was all about. Uh, and yes, there was an important story to be mined here, but he kind of thought he knew what he was getting into. And as we saw over season one, he didn't. And those preconceived notions were challenged. And what I love about him is that, uh, you know, he left season one thinking that he's he still knows what he wants and who he is. But there was this thing kind of lingering. And uh, I think in some ways he's lying to himself that it's, it's Rutherford Falls itself. But uh, in reality... The nice thing about Josh is that he is a kind of just a sweet guy who is following his heart ultimately. And of course, his heart is leading him to Regan, played by the wonderful Janish Meeting. Thank you, Dustin. And Jesse, what is the importance of the attitude of your character in order to create some of the dynamics that we see play out in the show? Uh, Bobby Yang has such a fun attitude. They're very witty and they're very straight to the point, um, which I feel like is beneficial to their character because in season two, they're running for mayor of Rutherford Falls. So um, what better way to be a politician than to tell the truth? <laughs> <laughs> what a novel concept. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Dustin, what is the biggest thing you've learned about Native America or Indian country in your research for this role? You know, I think one of the wonderful things about the show uh, and uh, certainly in, in leading up to the show and even prior to that, I'm from uh, the Northwest Territories in Canada. So uh, we were lucky enough to be exposed to a lot of the uh, indigenous cultures uh, uh, that call that area home. But uh, uh, when moving further down south and you start to realize just the total lack of not just only education, but just the lack of a conversation at all uh, in, in so much of uh, sort of the, the biggest media, what was so wonderful is that not only being a part of this show where we have uh, an incredible room of Native writers and also Sierra, uh, our showrunner and co-creator is Native, uh, but through that, just learning through humor and through joy and the celebration of uh, the modern uh, stories that all of these writers and creators are, are bringing together on the show, through that, just learning like uh, it's, it, you know, indigeneity is not monolithic. There's not just sort of one version of the story or one version of uh, what, uh, what an indigenous person can be, which of course, you know that intellectually, but just to see it so many examples through the show, just so many different specific nuanced characters that are also wildly different and so hilarious. Uh, it was, that was something that I just think you, you, 
didn't quite understand how that was going to uh, hit you until you uh, sort of start reading through the scripts and go, go through the, actually filming the show. And it was a wonderful surprise. Thank you, Dustin. Jesse, so much of this show is about increasing representation in Hollywood, and you are also adding to that by playing a non-binary role that in Indian country we sometimes call two-spirit. Uh, what do you see as the significance of bringing this role and representation into the television show? Um, playing a non-binary character is so rewarding and also very comforting because um, I identify as non-binary um, in real life. So to play a character that's so similar and also one that is flourishing in the small town of Rutherford Falls and one that doesn't dig into like past trauma um, or problems that they've had uh, when they were younger. We've seen so many characters, so many LGBTQ plus characters on screen um, just kind of being shadowed by their traumatic past or what have you. Um, but to play a character that is, um, is, you know, doing themselves and dressing how they want and wearing makeup if they want and teaching others how to apply their makeup. Um, it's, it feels really important um, to be playing that on screen. Thank you, Jesse. Dustin, uh, with some of the recent um, breakout roles you've had, I'm sure you had a choice of many different um, projects you could work on. What drew you to this one? Uh, you know, you'd think that, uh, but no, I auditioned for this just, <laughs> just like every other actor. Um, it, it, was, it was one of those things where, again, like, you know, growing up in the North, I was so excited that there was a show that was going to be uh, focusing on uh, Native representation and Native stories. But, uh, you know, I, I also was just hoping that I would get the job that they would like what I had to bring. Um, so I, I just feel very fortunate overall to, to be a part of that. And I think it's also something where we, you know, when you first, uh, in before we started shooting season one, uh, you only get to see a, a little bit of the script. So I didn't even fully comprehend it and know exactly how wonderful and how much of a celebration the show was going to be. Um, and so I just feel in some ways, it's like a serendipitous thing that, uh, I was, I was lucky enough to come from my teeny tiny town up north and uh, make it all the way down here and be a part of the show. It's, uh, it wasn't, it, <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't have the pick of, of any kind of job that I want. Uh, and luckily though, this job picked me. Awesome. Well, congratulations. Thank you. And uh, Jesse, so even today, I mean, you're dressed very stylishly and uh, I got to um, know quickly with Jana when I interviewed her about her uh, Native American earrings and the importance of bringing in Native fashion. Can you tell us about the component of fashion that is brought into the show and why that's important? In terms of Bobby's fashion? Is that what you're yeah, in terms of um, Bobby's fashion or just when I mean, you see perception on the um, on set, if you have any comments about that. I just, yeah. it's striking to me, you just look very dapper. So I was just building on <laughs> the um, well, fashionable, fashionable aspect of the show too. Mm -hmm. um me myself jesse i'm very inspired by the 70s and 70s fashion and music and movies and um i just really wanted to bring that um to this character and um in the 70s there was what was called the peacock revolution which was um men started to wear more tailored suits and more feminine style clothing. And um, it kind of created this blur with, um, with what you could wear and how you could express yourself. And I felt like that would be perfect for a non-binary character to wear something that is a little more femme than usual. And um, it makes me feel empowered and it makes me feel comfortable and yeah this is what I would wear on a normal day so it's it's fun to reflect um myself onto Bobby on screen in Rutherford Falls. Thank you Jesse. 
Thank you. And Dustin, uh, what has been your favorite memory so far working on either season one or season two? I think my favorite memory uh, probably would still be uh, shooting the scene with Michael Gray Eyes um, when uh, basically Josh and Terry are in his office in the casino. And uh, again, Josh is coming in, I think, with these preconceived notions of of who Terry is and uh, and you know how this is all going to go down. And he kind of fig- thinks he's figured him out. And uh, not only is it so beautifully written, uh, that the speech that then um, Terry gives Josh and, and that whole episode kind of builds towards that moment. But also just being there uh, on that day, shooting that, that scene uh, was something that uh, it, it, it really just kind of struck me how important, not just what was being conveyed through the dialogue, through what Terry's character was saying, um, but also just the fact that this was, we were on a studio lot in uh, LA. Uh, this is on a big network. Um, and this is something that was going to be seen around the world. And it was in many ways, uh, there's so many firsts, you know what I mean? Like having all of the uh, the writers being native in the writer's room, uh, or not all of them, but so many of them, and also Sierra, and just all of that building towards this, this wonderful sort of climactic moment where, uh, you know, the character finally gets to tell this, frankly, uh, kind of ignorant, slightly pompous white guy, like, this is what's really going on. And you think you know, but you, you really have no idea uh, and it was just so beautifully done. Michael was so wonderful in that moment. And uh, it, it was something that uh, professionally was definitely a high, but also personally uh, something I'll never forget. Well, thank you, Dustin. And thank you, Jesse. And we appreciate that you contributed to Native America Calling. Gunashish, thank you. Thank, thank you. you.